So I'd like to welcome all of you to this webinar, whether you're joining us live or you're watching the recording. Um, I'm so honored to host a panel discussion on the important topic of implicit bias in maternal health care with providers that I respect and admire so much. Um, I'm grateful to Dr. Strauss, to Holly and Melinda for their willingness to be here, to be vulnerable and share about their own personal experiences. Um, I'm sure that no one was happy when I <laughs> asked them to do this. It's like, will you, if you come on and share, but they all um, are willingly just putting themselves out there and that's admirable. Um, and I just wanna thank you all who are watching for your willingness to be vulnerable and start to look at your own unconscious biases or that within your healthcare systems. So I'm, my goal is to have a really good panel discussion with questions that we've come up with ahead of time, but then to leave time at the end of the webinar for you all to ask questions. And we'll use the chat box feature for that. So if you, and if you have any issues while we're going through this, please do use the chat box feature. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce the panelists today. So first I'm gonna introduce Dr. Bob Strauss. He is the Cephalo Bell Distinguished Professor of Maternal Fetal Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And as a specialist in high-risk obstetrics for over 20 years, he has cared for many women who've experienced loss. And in addition, through the UNC Center for Maternal and Infant Health, he helps support families with perinatal palliative care needs and their unique journey towards healing. Bob and his wife, Mary, have two children, Ryan and Isabella, and they lost their two-month-old daughter, Gabriella, during his medical training in 1998. And then we have Holly. She's a labor and Holly Curran is a labor and delivery nurse at and the coordinator of perinatal loss and nursing at UNC Chapel Hill as well. After two close friends experienced stillbirths, Holly closely looked at how she was caring for patients who experienced a pregnancy loss. And so with this new inspiration and drive, she set out to develop a standardized plan of care for these patients who are going through loss. Um, and she currently lives in Chapel Hill, North Carolina as well. Um, both Dr. Strauss and Holly are on the Return to Zero Hope Clinical Advisory Board. So again, I'm so grateful to both of you for being here. Um, and then Melinda Peterson is the chairperson for the board of directors for return to zero hope and she's also a brief mother she's a maternal death survivor she's a registered nurse and an environmental scientist so she has had a career change after her own experience of losing her son oak during her pregnancy um, and almost losing her own life and she just with her own experience felt a call to change her career and go into nursing so her passion is integrative medicine prevention of maternal health and healing after perinatal loss so i'm so grateful again to all of you um, and excited for a very important discussion around this topic of implicit bias in healthcare and just setting the stage and knowing that Black women are three to four times more likely to die during childbirth or from childbirth related complications. Um, black women are also twice as likely to have a preterm birth and twice as likely to have a stillbirth. So if you haven't watched our other two webinars focused on pregnancy and infant loss in the black community, you can find them on the Return to Zero Hope website in the webinar shop um, and they kind of give you an idea of why these numbers are so much higher in black women compared to white women and all other races um, as well as understanding the legacy of loss in the black community and that when there is a pregnancy or infant loss 
it is not just the loss of a baby, but it's compounded. So I highly encourage you to watch those two webinars if you have not already done so. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. And my first question to you all is, tell me about an experience where you've seen implicit bias and or systemic racism in your workplace. So this could be a personal experience or it could be something that you've observed. Well, maybe I'll start Kylie by, uh, and thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure and it's an important thing to talk about. Um, I'll just add a couple things to your list. You mentioned um, black women being more likely to die and have preterm birth. Black women, in, experience over 50% more unintended pregnancies. They not only have higher preterm birth rates, but one of the studies that came out of UNC was that even among college educated women with private insurance, those racial disparities hold up with prematurity. Black women are significantly less likely to express understanding that genetic testing is optional and they're less likely to receive recommended flu vaccinations during pregnancy, actually. Finally, at the time of birth, black women have higher C-section rates and they're more likely to experience postpartum hemorrhage differences, which are not explained by either the site of the delivery or patient level risk factors. So there are clearly multiple areas that we're working in that, that we see these, these discrepancies and disparities and we're learning more and more every day that, that even more exist. Um, one, one of the things that I observed, and, and actually one of my partners published at UNC, my partner Jasmine Johnson, is racial inequities in the evaluation of pain, postpartum pain, after a woman has had a C-section. And what, what we looked at was whether the frequency of the pain assessment by the nurse, so after a C-section, nurse goes into the room very frequently and the patient gets to circle a you know, has a scale from one to 10 with, you know, a happy face being one and a very upset crying face being number 10, the most pain you've ever experienced. And those assessments get done after a C-section very frequently. And they wanted to evaluate the frequency of the pain assessments, see if the treatments differed by patient race and ethnicity for women after the C-section. We reviewed 2000 charts. And basically the bottom line was found that racial and ethnic inequities in, the in both the experience, the assessment and the treatment of postpartum pain were identified. Black and Hispanic women reported higher pain scores yet received fewer assessments and less pain medication. And these differences were not explained by clinical factors that are associated with pain control. And the worrisome thing here is that it suggests that differential treatment by race might be contributing to inequities in how we manage postpartum care. Um, you know, we all like to think that we are not biased and, and, and we are not racist, but, but studies like that frighten me. Um, I'll add to that. Um, it is extremely interesting um, when we look at things like that and, and hard to really look at those numbers and, um, and suss out what is going on. But I will say that in my time, I've been a labor and delivery nurse at UNC for 12 years. And in that amount of time, I've seen approximately six maternal deaths. I mean, it's something that we, you know, never want to see in a labor delivery setting, but I, I, I really, you know, when a lot of this data came out about systemic racism and things like that, I really had to evaluate, um, you know, what I'd seen through the years. And when I look back at those deaths, I, I, at least four or five of those women were black women. And I think um, even even this past week, um, we had a very, very acutely ill patient um, and she was transferred from another hospital. And I immediately, you know, I was like, I, w I wonder if she is a black woman when I heard report and all of this, all of the things and she came in the door and of course she wasn't. And, and, and I wasn't surprised because um, so many of our very acutely ill women 
our black women. Um, and I think that at our hospital, we do a very good job um, of taking care of women um, of all races and all socioeconomic statuses, but um, you can't help but notice how many women um, are acutely ill. And is that from systemic racism within their families and what's happened to them? Have, you know, as far as medical care goes, have they um, had, had issues with family members getting correct treatment so that they didn't trust the medical system to care for them when they really needed it? And so I think we have to really evaluate um, those things as well and see why are these women getting to where they're getting and why are they getting as sick as they are and what can we do to really identify those needs before we get to that point. I echo what both Bob and Holly are saying, especially when it comes to pain assessments of um, black women. I, I work actually, um, I'll just to add to my bio here real quickly. I work in a trauma surgical unit in a University of Colorado hospital. Um, and most of my experience has come from my situation as a patient and then working actually in a different hospital and then also um, working at University of Colorado, Colorado Hospital System, excuse me. But I have noticed that in pain assessments, it is, it is where we are lacking. Um, and I would add, also add that another area where we're lacking is in ongoing education as well. I think that we have an education system as nurses for whether it be prenatal care or, um, or in my work, my line of work, whether it be uh, surgical, surgical site care or ongoing infection for when they go home. I have noticed that there's a, a lack of time spent with the patient um, and a lack of better understanding as um, a lack of, you know, assessing their knowledge before they go home. And so then it, it adds to complications down the road. And we can actually look at, you know, based on our trackers at work, we can look at our, the time that we spend in rooms and we can compare and contrast. And of course, you know, with the caveat of some patients are more acute, some patients have higher needs. And so you do have to spend more time in the room. However, you can notice that based on their own, the, the biases around that, especially black women or people of different, um, coming from different countries or different ethnicities, they tend to get fewer time spent from the nurses in their rooms. And so this really, it, it's something that we really need to look at. Um, it's, it's really, and it's really a holistic piece as well. It, it starts with um, care, preventative care, and it, you know, all the way through, you know, of whether you're acutely sick or, you know, you're leaving the hospital and you're taking care of something at home after you discharge, it, it's really the whole spectrum that we need to be looking at. And, you know, um, by working also on the preventative side and more and managing chronic conditions, and um, then we won't have as many of these other situations as well where we have people come that are acutely sick and that grows across the board. It's not just for, um, you know, people of different ethnicities or, or black women, but unfortunately, because the black women that I've spoken to don't feel welcome in preventative care, that's a whole other situation that we need to address. And I now, you know, along with that, um, you know, nurses spending less time in the room, I think there are things that we do, and I notice it more in the black and brown community, um, that we do in the hospital as far as sometimes, you know, what you wouldn't do in one room for the privately insured patient, or you would, you know, our medical students some, somehow seem to get into rooms more likely where they don't, you know, what am I trying to say? Basically, I don't think we ask as much. Um, like, can this person be involved in your care? Or, you know, especially when language barriers are there or when people are in a lower socioeconomic status or things like that. And I think sometimes we just don't um, give the same respect. And so I've oftentimes said to myself, you know, what if this patient was 
you know, an MVP, you know, we always say there's like MVP patients or, or people who we might work with who we're taking care of. Like, would we do the same that we're doing with other patients with that patient? Um, and so I think we really have to evaluate, you know, the respect we're giving to patients, the um, how many people are in the room and, um, and, and things like that. So I think, you know, we really just have to look at, at those things and evaluate, like, why are we doing those things with this patient and not with another? You mentioned the language barrier, Holly. That's something I today struggled with, you know, seeing patients and trying to explain a complicated diagnosis or a patient that has um, bad news on an ultrasound report. And, um, you know, I'm terrified that the process and of trying to get an interpreter and do that, have that conversation, um, that I might not give that patient the same amount of time. I'm, I'm so worried about that. And then add into it, we're in a pandemic and maybe I'm, I have to talk to that patient on a virtually with a third party interpreter. And, um, you know, I worry a lot that I'm not going to give that patient the same amount of attention. Well, I think, oh, go ahead, Melinda. Yeah, I was just going to say that I agree. The pandemic has brought up a lot of new challenges. And one of the major ones, of course, which is wearing a mask and um, not being able to really communicate, you know, a high percentage of how we communicate as humans is nonverbal. And so by, you know, of course, we need to, we need to mask up because we know that it prevents the spread of COVID. But it does take away from um, our communication skills, which is something that's vitally important. And so um, it's something that we should be looking at and addressing as well. How we do that, I don't know, but we're, you know, we're still trying to figure this out. And I think that the masks are going to be here to stay for the long term. So I was just going to, going off of what um, Holly and Bob said, giving us insight into their own experiences, like I just wanted to open up to to share about how, like, have you had certain experiences where you've noticed your own implicit biases coming up? Um, and did you, you know, did you do anything to acknowledge or change them? And Holly, I think you just, you just talked about this, like in a room, like acknowledging, like maybe I'm not treating this person the same. And if I think about it differently, like how would I treat the MVP patient? How would I, you know, how would I treat a coworker? So I think that's a great example. Um, so I just want to open it up to that. And I also know, Holly, I'm going to put you on the spot to share your story about that you shared at our board meeting as well. Sure. Um, we had a patient um, that was a black woman and her husband that came in, um, we knew she was coming for a, she had a stillbirth, or she was going to have a stillbirth. And I was, I think I was like charging her that day. So I was close by the front desk and the lady said to me, or she said at the front desk, she said, could I have a black nurse? And I immediately was like, you know, just taken aback by the whole scenario um, and, and thought to myself, well, you know, as, as a white person, would I be able to say that same thing at the front desk? And, and, you know, that wouldn't come across very well. And, you know, did she not think that I could take care of her? Like I immediately put it to me. Right. And, I, and which was completely selfish to even think that it was about me at all. Um, and one of our nurses, our per diem nurses, um, Corinda is a wonderful advocate in the black community. Um, she has two sons that are biracial. Um, and she's amazing, doing huge work um, with Black women and equity in the healthcare system. And, um, and she said, I know you have a lot of questions. And she, go, she asked me, she said, would you, could we go to breakfast? Because we can't discuss this here and now. It's, it's just too much to go into. And I said, yes, I, I want to understand why this woman feels this way that she once a black nurse, um, as opposed to, you know, someone who could take equally as good of care of her. And, and we did, we fulfilled her request for that. And, um, 
Corinda and I a week or so later went out to breakfast and we just sat down and talked about everything. And she said, you know, Holly, this woman is in so much grief right now that so many times when we're in grief, we seek for, you know, it's like, like, we want something that looks like us, right? And so for her, she knew that a black nurse could understand her grief process within, you know, her community and things like that better than maybe I could or someone else. And, um, and also just the, we talked a lot about like systemic racism and how that's played a part in, and why she may want that and why she may want that nurse and the fact that maybe she has distress in the system like we don't know what she's carrying into this space just like any other patient as well but with a whole lot of more um, microaggressions from society and, and things like that and so Corinda was like it's not that she wouldn't have been okay with a white nurse it's just that in this time she didn't need to have to process that with someone who didn't look like her um, and who may not feel the same way. And so we had a really great conversation. Um, there's a lot of books I need to read and I'm learning more and more every day. I have a lot of holes in the library right now. Um, but, you know, just a lot of things I need to learn. And it was very clear in that conversation. I grew up in a very white area um, and, and I have, um, you know, grandparents that were um, very racist and we had to talk about those things and how I, I don't desire I don't have the same feelings they do and how do I how do I deal with having had um, family members who were racist or or things like that and so just really looking into um, how I feel and that it's not about me uh, I think that was a big thing is it's not about the care that I could give or anything like that and so um, it was a really great conversation um, we will probably have many, many more in the next months, uh, but she is a fantastic resource. Thanks for sharing. I love that story, Holly. It's really inspiring. So I'll share a personal story and it's, it's really systemic bias is one of these things that it's like, it's, it's, it's difficult to know if it's just a, the situation or if there's actually a bias um, happening. But, you know, looking back on it in my experience. So I, this was in a different state, but I carried um, an ectopic pregnancy to, to 25 weeks. And um, there were multiple times when I was in prenatal care from the very beginning from when I, um, from when I first found out that I was pregnant. And there were multiple times when I was speaking to my OB and saying, you know, I'm noticing that my belly is growing on the left side and not my right side. And it's kind of doing this weird catch up thing where I, I noticed movement only on that side. And it would, it would, excuse me, I still get emotional thinking about it. Um, so I would notice that the belly would grow more on the other side and on, a, you know, not, not kind of more in the center. And on multiple occasions, I brought it up and, you know, they just kind of said, oh, you're a new parent, you're a new parent. But one thing that I noticed that really stuck out to me now that I start to think about systemic bias, and um, for, I'll just um, disclose too that I'm of Hispanic origin and my husband is white. And um, that there were times when we would ask questions in the OB provider's office, who, by the way, was a woman, um, she was a white woman. And she would answer those questions and speak to my husband and not to me. And the more that I look back at that, I, I realized, wow, like I, I didn't at the time, I thought maybe it was just, you know, like a new mom thing, or it was something that was just situational. But the more I look back at it, the more I realize that that was, you know, bias is happening as well to me. And it's, it's really um, frustrating because you look back and you feel so powerless as a person and, the fact that, you know, maybe it could have been prevented and, and it wasn't even that I wasn't seeking care. Um, and I also lost my ability to have future children. So there's just a lot that's wrapped up in this, um, a lot of grief and a lot of loss. And um, that's part of the reason why I got inspired to become a nurse. But it's also just that, um, yeah, so for me, it's very personal. And I, I take bias really seriously and I still notice that I have them. I still notice that, you know, my favorite patients are like, 
you know, certain, certain women, I spend more time in their rooms or, you know, and I, and I still look at charts and I think, oh, oh this one, you know, and I, I have that moment to myself where I think, oh, uh, oh, this one's going to be trouble. And I'm like, where is that coming from? You know, we all have them. We all have these biases. And, you know, unfortunately I've, you know, experienced it and, and, and it led to loss and of my baby and my fertility. Um, but I also have this opportunity to speak out about it. So, you know, here I am. Thank you. Uh, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll give a completely different example um, <clears throat> of a bias that I worry about that I, that I can, I, I have, um, <clears throat> and that's in the recruitment of our healthcare workforce and in our efforts in trying to, to have a diverse um, workforce in, in healthcare. And part of my job for the last 20 years has been involved in resident education and fellow education. And as part of that, I'm involved in the recruitment process and the interview process for that. This spring, we had just over 100 applications for a maternal fetal medicine fellowship. So this is an extra three years of training after residency to train just in high risk obstetrics. And out of over 100, we only interviewed 16 for two spots. And, you know, I have to look at over 100 applications and figure out which 16 to interview. And um, I worry a lot about um, bias in that process at, at many levels, not only race, um, but things like test scores. So there are standardized test scores that are in there from um, medical school. When, you're, when you finish your second year of medical school, you take this, the biggest test of your life called the step one. And those step one scores are in that application. And um, it's clear to me just from the reading I've done that, you know, really many experts consider those standardized test scores to be very racist and, and be a very racist policy. Um, and I worry a lot that I'm biased towards taking applicants that have higher step scores and potentially missing great applicants, maybe underrepresented or not underrepresented minorities, um, because they just, just because they don't have a higher test score, um, or just because of their race. I, you know, one of the things that started doing several years ago is making sure that the percentage of applicants that we interview is of underrepresented minorities that we interview is at least at least equivalent to the number that apply. Um, this year I started trying to ignore the step one scores and not look at that part of the application, but the problem is they're ingrained throughout. You know, when other people write letters of recommendation for these applicants, they often sprinkle st those scores into their letters of recommendation, particularly if the applicant did well on it. Um, I just learned last week, one of, actually an applicant just told me during an interview last week that she heard that the American Medical Association College is gonna stop scoring that step one score exam, that they're gonna have a change in policy and just have the students take the test, but just have it be a pass fail. And that's the real um, answer, right, is to change policy. And um, that's that's the real, anti-racist thing to do is to to affect policy change and those are the kinds of things that um you know i, I want to be doing more and figure out how to do, how to do more <laughs> very interesting yeah all all completely different examples but yeah thank you and i just want to say melinda thank you for sharing about your personal story as well um so the next question I want to ask is in your, whether it's in your professional training as a nurse or a doctor or in your workplace, has there been like tools or training around examining implicit bias? So, so are they talking about it in your trainings or uh, like in your, you know, medical education training or in your workplace, are they 
giving you opportunities to look at your bias look, and looking at bigger policy and higher level instances like Bob was talking about. I mean, I, and, I and it, oh no, I was gonna say, and if not, do you believe that a focus on this self-examination for providers should be mandatory? So I guess the first thing is, is anyone doing anything, first of all? I don't really feel like we got a lot of that in training. I think we're getting better. Um, we're fortunate to work um, with some really fantastic um, doctors who are doing a ton of work in that space. I mean, um, Dr. Strauss mentioned Jasmine Johnson. Um, she, she's been doing um, amazing, amazing work and really um, getting, getting information out there. She was, I have to like cheer for her. She was on CNN and ABC News um, doing work um, within the medical community. But as far as training, I mean, we haven't really had that in the past. I think, um, I think it should be mandatory for us to look at um, what our biases are um, and really examine that. I think we would all be better for it, um, but it is hard. I think at the same time, there are people that don't want um, to go into depth in that category because it's really difficult um, to examine ourselves and realize that we aren't perfect people and that our life stories have led us kind of to where we are and um and how our you know our biases have formed and just like melinda said earlier i mean sometimes it's really difficult to look at a chart of a patient and not form biases and i think we need ways and tips on when we notice that about ourselves what's the what's the next step to do right and i think even in sometimes um report in the morning when we come on and we're getting a report from an you know an offgoing nurse our biases are sometimes skewed even by what that person tells us and so i've learned that even if i get really negative information about a patient that i try to just really start fresh in the morning if i don't know them and um just kind of not let their opinions form my my opinions and um, but I do think we need a lot of, we need self-examination tools. We need, um, we need ways and tips on if we do know these biases are there, what do we do? And how do we, how do we get past those and, and move forward um, and acknowledge them? The, just in the, in the last year on the provider side, the healthcare system is now requiring mandating at least a minimum of two sessions or courses a year on implicit bias um, for us to do and the hospital just this last week has created a new, a new position of a executive director of health equity who is going to lead multidisciplinary and collaborative um, teams evaluate science-based strategies, interventions to help address the policies that are currently in place and the health disparities that are currently in place. So we're, we're, we're just, just beginning, just beginning to head, you know, in the right direction. Um, but I, I've been impressed, you know, Holly, you just to sort of echo what you said, I've been impressed at how engaged um, so many of the faculty seem to be um, in the process has, has, has been, has been great. My, my group, just my, division within the department um, just a couple of weeks ago met on a, you know, virtually met on a Sunday afternoon at two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, just to talk through some of these things and to come up with a plan, an action plan of things that we can do to try to um, um, improve diversity and equity. Yeah, I have a unique perspective of having been only a few years out of nursing school and going through nursing schools and as an old, older adult, um, we we did have actual bias training in school. It was about a half a day 
uh, where we talked about exploring, we did a self-examination tool, and we talked about exploring our own biases and what that means. And it was a really eye-opening training because I think when I first went into it, I was expecting, well, you know, I'm the person that, you know, gets, receives the microaggressions because, you know, I, my skin's a different color. Um, I, I understand more fully, you know, what the black perspective is because I have, I'm kind of dipping a toe in and I realize, um, you know, it's not at all the case. And we all have our little, we, we all have our sometimes big biases and, um, and it's just how we act upon those um, really changes our care. And so it was a really eye-opening experience. But then moving forward, um, we are starting to, I don't know if we've actually hired someone system-wide, that would be a really great thing to do, Bob. And I applaud um, your health system for doing that. But we are starting to receive more information on bias training and um, different types of tool sets to look at biases. But I, um, I also, you know, echo what Holly was saying about handoff report, which is such an important part of the nursing practice, especially in acute care. Um, it, it, I would love to see a situation where instead of, you know, starting the bias situation from handoff report, where when you're receiving handoff report or when you're giving handoff report, you can actually verbalize and feel comfortable verbalizing that, you know, I had these biases going in and I acknowledged them and it was actually not what I expected. Because I think that that would, having that communication, that openness, that vulnerability in our setting and in handoff, because that's where we really, you know, come together as a team. I think that would be huge. So if we could, you know, something like that moving forward where we could be where the hospital system or whomever could guide us in the way of having these open conversations and 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 providing the um the acceptance of that kind of conversation because i think right now we don't say anything because we're too shy about it because we don't, don't want to be honest about it because it's messy and um and also because we're fear of losing our job like who's going to want to admit that they had a bias about a patient in their job setting so to make it an okay situation, to make it comfortable within the right context, to um, to say, you know, I had these biases and this is how I worked through it. And that would be huge. Um, so if we could change the culture of our hospital system to, and even if it just starts with handoff reporter, that's something that's included. I think that would be huge. So I think this, we're already in this next, next topic of really like what can we do in our everyday practices um, whether it's on a personal level or on a larger level of policies and I know that like just to review some of the things that have been, have been discussed so it's you know on a big level hiring someone in the healthcare system to focus on equity and diversity. Um, Melinda, you mentioned having these open conversations and really acknowledging implicit bias and communicating that. Um, so it's like being vulnerable is a huge thing, right? It's like being honest, being open, being vulnerable, um, even when it feels uncomfortable, but it's, it will make changes. Um, and then Bob was talking about the just changing policies were maybe not even policies, but just the way they do things when they're interviewing residents and fellows. So like not looking at the step one scores, making sure that they're interviewing enough mi minorities representative of the applicants, things like that. So. I think this was all, probably the part of the discussion that most people will be most interested in is like what are actual things that we can do to make changes and to make an impact in a positive way. Um, I think going back, Melinda, to what you said about just having those open conversations, I think they are really difficult 
and we do have to get really vulnerable. And sometimes that's really difficult for people, especially within the workplace. Um, I feel like nursing um, is a, it's unique in that we can be vulnerable oftentimes with our coworkers. But I think even if it's just, you know, again, changing the, working to change the culture and how we have those conversations. But I think if it's just one thing where I recognize and I can say, even if it's to the ongoing nurse or whoever, I had this bias, it was very different than what I imagined. Um, and I, I need to evaluate that. I think if I can say that, it then influences, I mean, we have a ton of new nurses at UNC right now and in our labor and delivery. Um, and if I can do that as an experienced nurse and have those vulnerable conversations and say, you know what, I was really wrong about this situation. I judged it before I walked in. Um, I think that it really speaks to others around us. And I think that a small act like that really can change culture and it can change how maybe they look at things in the future when they're, when they think, well, Holly, you know, walked into the scenario and realized that it was different than what she thought um, and try and really worked on changing her thought process. And so if we can do that slowly over time, it's going to shift our, our whole, um, our unit culture. And so I think that's really important, even if it's those tiny little things, I think they can make a really big difference. And do you think it would be beneficial to create dedicated time space to having conversations of, around this topic? Like ha has your, has your workplaces done? Oh, Bob, you said you, you did. So on a Sunday, a few Sundays ago, but Holly and Melinda, have you all done that? I think we've had, we've had opportunities um, that weren't required. So Corinda that I was speaking about before has done some classes on things, but of course it's not, it wasn't required. So, you know, the turnout was not probably as good as it, it should have been or could have been. And, and so I think if we, if, the, if our system said, here are things that we're gonna require you to do um, and you can choose, you can choose what you want to do um, and what seminars you want to go to or roundtable discussions. I think that would be really important because I think, again, we don't want to look at ourselves and, and be like, Ooh, you know, I, um, I really need to delve into that. Um, and it might be messy and messy things, you know, really people, I mean, it's just like the loss, you know, I have certain nurses who are like, Oh, I don't even want to go there. Um, because it, it, there's too much feeling and, and things like that. And so I think that we really have to, um, our hospital systems have to have buy-in into um, really making it a requirement. Yeah, I agree, Holly. And I think the onus can't just be on nurses. And that's part of the reason, too, I also applaud, you know, Bob for being here. Because I think um, right now, yes, it's part of our nursing education to look at the biases. But it's, it's really a larger conversation amongst um, management, amongst um, MD providers, amongst uh, physical therapists. And I think if we can all take an integrated approach into having these conversations and not just have most of the onus on the nurse, um, that will build a better community over time as well. And um, I think where we do, I mean, we've proven in big hospital systems and that we've proven that we can do really good modules and really good education kind of online and you know those things but it's really and it's of course you know the difficult part is when you actually get people speaking with each other and that's um and really opening up and then when you see leadership and management and other people that you you know you might look up to you know um speaking their mind as well and not just having you know the onus on other types of providers, I think that makes a huge impact as well. I, um, like really anything in my life that is, I don't understand or is stressful, I um, tend to just try to read about it. And I, I have tried to read about, um, about these issues. I'll, you know, in my drive home from Raleigh today, I'll I'll listen to my audiobook. My I'm, I'm on my fourth book about disparities and racism, but I'm just scratching the surface and just beginning to understand. And the more I read, the more I realize I don't understand, and the more that I don't know. Um, 
but at least on a personal level, that's, that's how I've tried to, to approach it, you know, on a practical level, you know, at the hospital, um, some of the things that we have talked about is, you know, directing financial resources and research funding towards um, projects that look at social equity and justice um, about an easy thing to do is to, to bring structured curriculum into the curriculums of our residents and our medical students and our fellows. You know, they they, it's easy for them because they have dedicated time that's set aside. So that's a real easy thing to, to um, put that into the, build that into the curriculum. And then, and then doing it on, on, a, on a larger level at, you know, a weekly M&M conference, a weekly morbidity and mortality conference is, is bringing in issues about race and inequity um, are, the, are, the, are the, you know, baby steps that, that we try to take, you know. And I often wonder, you know, lots of our patients um, aren't seeing, I mean, they're transfers into our care or they are delivering at our hospital because they're a high risk pregnancy, but and they they would normally go to their clinic in their own community. And some of those communities, I mean, I, I wonder what they're experiencing in there. So in those communities and in those smaller clinics or a hospital that they've been to within their own town. And um, that's hard because we are, we are very much in the South and there are still, um, I mean, there's racism everywhere, um, but you know, the South has been known um, for those things. And so I just, um, I wonder what they're experiencing. And I'm glad that um, as a system, we are really working on this. And I think that extends, we have a lot of hospitals and clinics um, kind of far from us, which is helpful because if everybody's getting that training, I think that's really important, but sometimes it feels overwhelming to think about these small community hospitals and, and what are, you know, old school doctors there um, doing and have people experienced this racism or um, systemic bias before they've gotten to us and how does that paint the picture of the medical system um, when they get to us and, um, and how do we, what do we do to ensure them or, or or build trust with them um, when they've had those experiences. It's, it's just hard, it's a big issue. I'm talking without unmuting myself. Oh. Yeah, I think, I mean, it is big and I think, but I think it's important right, to, to start taking first steps, um, which will lead to more steps and, and uh, bringing it up out in the open for discussion and saying this is a priority, um, we need to focus on this. And yes, I agree that it needs to happen on, yeah, not just on, in one discipline, but in, in all disciplines, in the management and leadership of a healthcare system. Um, so on very many levels. So I, I want to open it up now to anyone who's on, live on the webinar. Um, if you all have any questions for any of the participants. And you can go ahead and type it into the chat box. Because I think this could be an opportunity to can we test the waters of a certain situation that you may have in your healthcare setting um, and you want to hear it, you know, maybe they haven't talked about in this particular instance what they're doing um, and they could give some guidance around that or we could brainstorm around it. Um, it could be an incident where you may have been the object of implicit bias or systemic racism and wanting to share about your experience as well. I'm, I'm not sure on the webinar who, who are healthcare providers um, only or who are healthcare providers and bereaved parents, so.
Now we will have an awkward silence while we wait. Okay, so um, this is from Millie. Hi, Millie. Good to see your name. So she says to Holly and Robert, how do you think you would respond if a patient told you that they experienced you as being biased? Well, I, I um, worry that I, you know, that I don't see my own biases. I, I, I would hope, and I think I would be very open to listening to them and to learning and to being the first one to admit that, that I have a lot to learn. Um, um, and I, 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 I do always appreciate whether it has to do with a bias or not, just any time a patient is upset or concerned about something, you know, I always appreciate them bringing it to our attention. That's the only way that we can learn from it, right? And what we all want is to help reduce the chances of the next patient experiencing the same thing. And so um, I'm usually pretty um, open to listening to, to that. I, I have not, it's an interesting question because I don't think I've yet had that exact thing happen. You know, patients usually, complain or upset about different things. I have not had a patient um, complain about me personally being biased, but I'm sure that I have, and I'm sure that I've made patients feel that way. And I, I guess one of the good things is that more and more people are talking about this. So maybe hopefully over time, it'll become easier for patients to tell providers when they feel like that, you know. Um, just for those of you who don't know Dr. Strauss, um, his patients would never complain about him because he's that amazing and he cares so much for all of his patients. So um, for him to say that, that's, you know. Um, that's good that you're here, Molly. <laughs> he didn't pay me to say that. Um, I, um, I would hope that I would um, not become, I think it's difficult, right? When we're kind of accused of something, I think sometimes it's difficult to, not like get our defenses up. And I, um, what I hope I would do in that scenario is just, is to sit down, um, you know, with that patient and apologize, number one, for any biases that they felt like that I had. And again, just like Dr. Strauss said, um, just say that I do have a lot of learning to do. I'm working on those things. Um, I feel like I'm actively working on those things now. Um, Maybe, you know, when I was a brand new nurse, I didn't, I didn't realize that as much, but I think as I've gotten older and more experienced, um, trying to really recognize those things. And so, I, um, you know, listening to a patient and, and letting them tell me why they felt the way that they did. And again, um, just trying to be humble in the process and, um, admit my faults and that I would work on those things and continue to educate myself. Um, so that that wouldn't happen again. Thank you both. Um, okay, then the next one's a more of a comment. So I'm Kathy. She says, it's required yearly education in our institution, as it should be. Staff are empowered to ask each other and hold each other accountable um, in reporting or, or signing out. So Right, so if it's, if they're bringing it up, if, if they're talking about it and then it can be more open conversation and not as shameful. And then she's also said, ask your patients and families about their experiences. Having a more diverse workforce is essential. I found patients sharing with people of color in environmental services over talking with white staff. Kylie, can I address the um, ask your patients and families about more experiences point? So that's one of the ways that I've noticed that I've dealt with my own bias is kind of come into it um, with an acquisitive mind. So if I notice that I have a bias that's coming up, I start to ask myself, okay, okay. am I having a bad day? Um, did something that about me that I'm feeling this way and then also on the patient side as well like 
um, being more inquisitive with them. We don't know the experience that they're carrying. We don't know what has happened to them systemically uh, to be in this situation. You know, maybe they're in panic or fear or that they're experiencing pain at a higher level because they're in panic and fear. Um, and just coming in with that inquisitive mind about, um, you know, I am open, everybody is where they are as a result of their experiences. And so what is it that I need to know about them or what, what can I ask them to, that will help me better inform my own, my own situation and understand my Oh, and I agree too as well with the um, patient sharing with environmental staff. I have walked in on many conversations like that where, you know, they're going very deep into their family life and their experiences and what brought them to the hospital and all those pieces. And I walk into a conversation like that and then everything goes silent. I think part of that is a couple things. Part of that is, of course, just we have a tendency as humans to relate to people, you know, that are culturally similar. It's just, and that's part of why we're, we're where we are is because, um, you know, that leads to bias and it leads to institutionalized racism and all those bad pieces. But it's also in some ways, you know, a good thing with your, with your family and your cultural beliefs, you have these, these, um, you know, these, these ways that we experience things with each other that we can't experience it with, with sometimes with other people right away. That's not to say that it can't happen. Um, but the other side of that is also the white coat syndrome, which is also like a real thing. And that of course comes from, you know, that systemic bias and feeling like they're not heard or feeling like they don't belong in our medical system. So as soon as a, somebody who comes in that has, you know, some kind of like authority, a nurse or provider or anybody, um, that we understand that, that um, you know, we come in with that kind of that role that, that can sometimes be off-putting and can sometimes be um, harder to relate to. Um, so that's something that as well, and that comes again from all that, the years of feeling like they weren't heard and um, the years of institutionalized racism and not being able to trust people in those roles because of also horrible things in our history where we have, um, you know, done experiments on people and all these things, you know, it's all related. It's so important that we know like our, our history, we know, do we just better understand too, like how um, we come across, even if we don't, even if we're coming in with a completely open mind, which, you know, of course is possible, but even if we come in with a very, very, very open mind and we understand our biases, we still have that, um, that kind of that wall in between us that it's hard to break sometimes with really any of our patients. And so um, just being aware of that and, you know, um, some of the, the biggest ways that I deal with it from the beginning are, you know, I, I sit bedside as opposed to standing over the patient in a position of power. And that's sometimes the environmental services. I think the reason why they have a, more of a connection too with patients is that they're in the room longer, you know, they have, you know, oftentimes their body language is a lot more relaxed. They're not stressed. They're not trying to get to the next room. You know, like we come in, we're stressed. We've got a million things to do. We've got a chart. We've got to assess. We've got to um, bring them medications, all these things and forget to kind of like, you know, um, take a deep breath and, you know, meet them where they are. And I think that would, and that's, you know, where some of that comes from. So. I think we can do a little bit better just being aware of that, those, you know, the, the, the cultural piece and the, the, the white coat syndrome um, as well. Are, are there other, I mean, until, well, are there any other questions? Feel free to type them in the chat box, but um, are there other ways that small things that can make bigger differences on how we're interacting with families. So like 
as you said, Melinda, like sitting at the bedside, like things like that. What are other, other suggestions of things that you, people work, you know, and, and it doesn't have to be just nursing. It could be in an outpatient setting. Um, how, how can we build connections as a human, I think, is kind of the underlying thing and, and take away some of that fear. I think um, clearly if, it, if you're a person talking to a patient at eye level is, uh, I would just reinforce how important I think that is. I, I have found, you know, in modern healthcare, we are all over the place. We're at the main hospital. I'm at an office out in Raleigh today. Tomorrow I'll be to a satellite office in Chapel Hill. We're all over the place. And so the days of just everybody being in the hospital and rounding on their patients, seeing their patients are getting further and further away from us. And so what I found to be surprisingly effective and powerful for me is a phone call. Is that when I come out here to Raleigh this morning and one of my patients delivered at UNC giving her a call, which takes one minute, but I have found that to be a very powerful way to connect with people. Um, one of the jokes of a lot of nurses are, you know, that work on our floor are that I can find out a lot of information about a patient and a very like personal information. They'll quiz me on how much I know about the patient. But I, that's the thing that I really enjoy. And I think is really difficult when I have a patient that might not speak the same language as me, that it, it's a big barrier. Um, and we have patients that speak a lot of different languages, but I, I do feel like it's much more, it's much harder for me to connect, but I try to, I mean, sometimes our patients are acutely ill and, you know, obviously they need a lot of things, but I try to connect to their family in some way and, and search for a commonality so that they can realize that I'm a real person who has a life outside of work. Um, and that, you know, I, I care about, you know, obviously I'm genuine in it or you know, really try to be genuine about things because I want to know about, you know, do they have other children? Do they, what's, you know, who, who's in the room with them and, um, and things like that, because, and I, I think that that across the board, even with our, we have brand new residents in our hospital right now. And, and I try to get to know them really early on and learn details about their lives, because I think that we work better together when we know um, this person, you know, they have a whole life outside of the situation that we're in. Um, and I think that that is really important. I, I really like to get to know my patients well. And fortunately, I, in, in labor and delivery, most of the time I can, and certainly in the law, the perinatal loss arena, I get to know families extremely well. Um, I sat with a black family last week, and um, that was, you know, really lovely. We had, and we had so many connections, and it was, it was just a really beautiful moment. And I, I, you know, I really did feel like they, they trusted the system that um, they were in, and I, and I don't know exactly where. Um, that family was coming from if they've experienced, um, you know, um, racial inequalities within the healthcare system. But if we can, again, in, in small ways, just sitting down with patients, discovering who they are, what their needs are, and really getting personal, um, if, if, they're, if they're willing to open up with us, I think is, is extremely important and, and builds trust within the system. Absolutely, Holly. And I like to just, um, Personally, I like to, to come into the room and actually just make the statement like, no one knows your body better than you do. I'm just here to help facilitate your healing. And I think when you kind of give them that power, the power shifts in the room because when you, when you acknowledge that they, they can tell you if, they, if something's hurting or they notice that something's off or they, you know, all these things, when they, when they realize that the power is with them, within them, um, then that I trust that and I acknowledge that, I feel like the lines of communication open a lot more. Well, 
I'll just share from Kathy again. Kathy, you have great um, comments here. So she said, listen in silence, share the same letters. So leave space and quiet and try to find some time to sit with them. Even a few minutes of sitting down can make a big difference. So uh, as Melinda and Holly were saying, and Bob, right? It's just um, holding space for them and empowering them. And then Millie, she said, professionally, I found a lot of success in providing a small piece of literature to patients that describe implicit bias, addresses how a practice is combating or training themselves on implicit bias, and what their options are for resources in the presence of implicit bias. So educating and empowering the patients to be aware of what this looks like, what implicit bias looks like, and what they can do about it. So that's, have any of you seen that in your work settings? I don't think so, but I, I think that's a wonderful idea. Millie, maybe, I mean, I, I know Millie, so I'm, but maybe you would be willing to share that um, or an example of something like that offline that, you know, that, that is a, that's a really good idea. Um, Nancy is an RN. She said, recently I asked a client to help me better understand implicit bias. I was shocked by the fears and experiences she related. I was blown away by her fears. And when she gave personal experiences, I realized how often the experiences occur. It is not years ago. Um, so I think she's saying it's not only years ago that this is happening, but it's happening right now. So thank you for sharing that, Nancy. Yeah, that we, we sometimes in this position of white privilege don't understand what other people are experiencing and the need for listening and opening up the conversation um, in a real intentional way, very interesting. Yeah, and, and Millie, Millie, back to her um, literature, she said, oh, this small piece of literature could be a great conversation starter, right, to start talking about implicit bias. Um, and with a patient, but also with, I mean, I'm, I'm adding this, this is not what she's saying, but um, within your staff, right? And so as part of the education of the staff is educated in what what that is, but then also saying like, we're gonna do this with patients. Um, because I think some, oftentimes I'm, I'm assuming that we don't, we don't know what they're experiencing and what examples of this could be. And if we, and if we aren't taught of what to look for, then we'll just keep living in the same way and acting in the same way, so. Yeah, I, th I think a small piece of literature is a great conversation starter and actually even something, you know, maybe this is down the road, but something where, you know, we have some kind of a a commit, like a system wide commitment, you know, and we actually express, we put it on the walls, you know, that we, you know, this is an this is a bias friendly hospital. I, I, I don't know the exactly how to word it, but something where um, you know, people can come in and, and see that this is something that we find important um, as providers that, you know, that we have a commitment, we have a commitment to addressing implicit bias, that's something that they can see right away that's clear. And I know, I mean, I know it's kind of, it's on, you know, a, a patient right and responsibilities 
plaque in the front of our hospital, but I mean, really calling it out and saying, you know, that we have a commitment um, to look at and to look at biases within the system and improve upon them and acknowledge them. Um, I think would be huge. The more that we can show it openly to our patients, the better to start to break down these walls and barriers. I mean, I'd like to open it up to people who are listening or watching, listening. Um, do you have experiences of implicit bias, whether you've been um, noticing your own bias, noticed experiences where you work that, you know, where patients have been I'm not finding words right now, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but I guess just like, I'd love to hear from you all, like your experience and where you've seen implicit bias and systemic racism and have you been impacted it, impacted personally by it as a patient or as a provider, have you seen it? So that's, I guess. Okay, so Nancy said, thank, Nancy, thanks for sharing. Um, I did not recognize my biases until the patient gave me examples of her experiences. I feel like I'm only beginning to peel back the layers to my biases. Yeah. So again, the importance of education around this on the you know, on the provider side. I think it can be overwhelming as a provider, like as Bob says, like I'm, I'm on my fourth book that I'm listening to and me too, I have all these books that I wanna read and things like that. Um, but there there's so much and and so i feel like the need for a a specific training on this topic to kind of call down the information to get people together in a room to talk about it to talk about what what is going on and what you know how are they going to bring shine a light on it bring it more into the topic of conversation to hold each other accountable is is important. Well, and I think like anything, you know, long term problems require long term solutions, right? And so, so we can't just kind of have one bias training and, and call it good. It, it's going to be months, years, you know, decades until we can really integrate um, this into our work. And I think kind of allowing for that and allowing for the understanding that we're, we're all, you know, like you said, Kylie, we all, we're, we're human. And so we want to read as much as we can. We want to, we want to fix it right now. We have such a fix it culture and we can't. Um, and just acknowledging that, that we are working toward it and it's, it's an ongoing long-term thing, you know, and I think we'll have better results to that way if we take, you know, short-term actions, but with a long-term approach. Um, so I think, I think about that with my children, you know, like, um, 
I have three kids and you know, the environment that we live in right now is, is, is challenging um, to say the least of with um, everything that's been going on um, since, um, you know, all the George Floyd protests and, and things like that. And um, I just think about, you know, again, it is a long-term thing. And so when we were talking about it, um, I just, I, I think it's really important to just be open in, in our families and, um, and have those conversations, those hard conversations. And, um, you know, I just think I'm trying to raise them to be people who, um, who speak up for, you know, people who, who are, who are less fortunate or less, or just, you know, who others, um, or who might be affected by, you know, um, racism and things like that. And so I think it is, a, it's a long-term thing. And I think we really have to be talking about it in our homes. We have to be really going there, um, and having hard conversations. Um, I think the other thing that I have, that I've done that I think was really helpful is just to go to, um, people that I work with and people of all different titles from the janitorial staff to nurses that I work with who um, are, are black or, um, or Hispanic and just and said, you know, what can I do um, to help with this in, in my own life, um, in, my, in my, my personal life, in my work life, um, what can I do? And just to be, um, to have them hold me accountable to my actions or my biases or, or things like that. And um, I think it's just important um, to do those things, to have those hard conversations. So would you, any of you mind sharing, um, you, you being panelists, mind sharing like of what you've been reading and watching to help yourself learn and self-examine what has been helpful and would you recommend to others? Um, I've read some of um, Abram X. Kendi's works. Um, I watched him last week. He did a one hour webinar also. Um, but um, his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist is, I think, very good. Um, I think if you want to just learn about the history of racism, his book um, called Stamped, um, and there's two, he has two versions. He has a grown-up version, he has sort of a kid's version, um, but I think those are good. Um, I just, I, I just started White Fragility, so I, I'm not, I, I'm not that far into that yet. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Um, it's reading has been, um, put on hold for a little bit only because life has been a little crazy, uh, <laughs> trying to figure out this whole school situation and, um, having, uh, a lot of people in my house all day, every day. Um, but I have really tried to look at, you know, in like the social media world, um, am I who am I following in the social media world? And so really increasing um, the diversity of people that I follow. Um, because again, one thing that was brought to my attention is we often, um, you know, even in our Instagram worlds, right? We oftentimes um, go for someone who might be similar to us. And when I looked at who I was following, I was like, gosh, that is so true. And so really diversifying uh, the people that I'm following so that I can um, get more information from, you know, lots of different sources and um, diverse sources. And so really doing that and trying to um, look at you know what have i what have i been reading you know in the past like have i really read books by many black authors or or things like that and really trying to diversify that as well but um white fragility or how to be an anti-racist is um on my queue um so and i was over here taking notes of, of different things so that you know i go on vacation next week so um <laughs> maybe i'll delve into um some more reading while i'm 
while I'm there. I agree with what Holly said. I have changed um, who I follow on social media dramatically. I've especially in the perinatal loss community, I've been um, exploring more black moms and um, a lot of them have their own nonprofits as well. So it's really interesting, not only from Return to Zero Hope's perspective and partnering and what we can do with the, these groups moving forward, but just also better understanding uh, their experiences. And I also um, have been watching um, and listening to podcasts and um, YouTube videos, especially by Renzma Menekem. He is a, he's from Minnesota. He's a trauma informed, I believe he's a therapist. Um, and he wrote a book called My Grandmother's Hands that I just ordered and I'm, it's, it's a trauma. So it goes into the actual trauma and where we carry it in our bodies and all, all those pieces of how trauma impacts a person um, from the black perspective and why, um, you know, why, what, what the black people actually experienced is a trauma and um, what we can kind of do to better understand that part of it. Um, and I, I think RTZ Hope has that approach as well with, you know, baby approaching baby loss as a trauma because it is. And understanding that better, I think, um, helps us to unravel, whether it be in the loss, you know, community or whether it be in relationship to systemic bias, understanding the trauma involved is so important in um, how we, you know, approach our biases and how we approach our care and how we approach um, communication and, and really everything. Um, so he has a really, really good way of um, communicating the trauma in a, in a way that we can understand based on our own traumas, whether it be from baby loss or wh what have you. And it's, a, it's really um, personal and, and um, you know, empathetic approach that we can take. So um, I highly recommend checking him out. Yeah, I have his book too. So I'm excited. I listened to a podcast by him and it was it blew my mind. So we're in the book. I'm excited to read that. Um, so I think right now um, we're going to wrap up, but if anyone has questions, um, I will, I will send out a link to the recording, um, which will have my email address on it. And you're welcome to email me with any other questions. Um, if you we're not offering CEUs, but if you would like a certificate of, attendance for this, I can give you that. You can, again, email me back after I email you. And um, I just want to say thank you again to Melinda, Bob, and Holly for, for, being, for being part of the RTZ HOPE team um, and for being here and being vulnerable and opening up themselves to sharing personally and professionally uh, what is going on in terms of implicit bias and systemic racism. So thank you. I'm grateful to you all. Um, you. And finally, it's just another reminder that, and I'll include these in the email as well, but please go watch those other webinars. They're free. Um, there's two of them. One's grieving, why black mothers are grieving differently. And the other one's challenging the superwoman mentality in the black community. Um, so I'll provide a link for that as well. But I think just again, right, educating ourselves and learning um, is really an amazing first step to take if, if we don't know anything and we just, we just take the first step and we start learning and we're being open. So thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Kylie. Thank you, everyone. Bob. And Holly. Good to see you, Melinda. <laughs> nice to see you too. <laughs>